Yeah, so there we go. So we're live as soon as I turn the camera on. No, you're cool. I just wanted to see the system. Get it, you know. It's called a Cerebo. It's, it's only for Ustream. Stream. For Ustream, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it's what super easy. I, you know, I, I set not, it up myself, it, but I'm not a tech person. And you, it's not that expensive either. It's about uh, $300. Oh, man, yeah, I, I got it. Definitely, okay. And you can use it with a Wi-Fi, or you can use it with an Ethernet. Of course, I had to try to... This is the most reliable, is if you're directly plugged into the Internet. That's good because you get a similar then it just has an HDMI cable that attaches to the yeah, camera. Yeah, similar type of uh, um, You just have to have camera. a camera that can take the HDMI. HDMI, yeah. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. What time to start? Uh, now? 245. Would it be helpful to like have the folks who are dying? I plugged in an extra um, mic to have like the folks who are doing report back come up and speak into the mic so we can capture like yeah. that on. Yeah.
Um, and importantly, it's crafted with the input of those who are affected by this policy. Um, you know, too often we're stuck in our areas of specialization, and we wanted to ground this event, you know, with the feeling that um, we're all confronting the same enemy, really. Um, and we can't afford to be relegated to our, like, one square inch of specialization um, on Earth. And, uh, you know, if we're going to, um, you know, if we're going to ensure a just future that respects our rights of food, dignity, housing, and the like. Um, and our, our common enemies, uh, they're pretty clear. I've heard them in a lot of the discussions. Um, the privatization of our public goods and the records that it causes to our communities. Um, those with the most money have the most say in development, and um, the most dominant developmental practices put profits ahead of the people. And um, meanwhile, the space in which we can be publicly involved is drastically shrinking. Um, we have this heightened sense of disempowerment, and I know folks who are um, local have probably read this article, the, um, Baltimore City, You're Breaking My Heart, uh, went viral in like an hour. Um, and for the folks who are from out of town, it was basically um, a store owner, I believe, a business owner, um, who pays her taxes, and she was like really upset about the violence that's like spilling over into her neighborhood. Um, and she wrote this open letter to the mayor, um, basically asking for more police. And I, you know, thought this was like such an impoverished sense of uh, community and personal agency, um, because you know we, we can't afford to like have somebody do democracy for us. We can't hire them to do it. Like this is our job. We have to do it now. Um, and we do it through our day-to-day -day engagement on these issues. And you know, these issues are extremely interconnected. As um, you've heard a lot of folks mention, Michael Coleman's speech last night was outstanding in connecting those dots through policy and production. And it's intimately connected to the environment. You know, we have the right to a healthy environment, and we need housing that meets that need. And um, you know, we have to have responsive mechanisms of governance. But how are we going to have time to stay publicly engaged in all of these mechanisms of governance across all these issues if we're shackled with debt just trying to make ends meet and then pay the interest on those loans? Um, so, uh, you know, we've covered today like a ton of ways that uh, folks can plug in um, to ways that we can like democratize our economy. And uh, basically, I wanted to use this opportunity to kind of hear back from folks from all the different tracks. So if you stuck with something, that way you can hear what other folks were talking about and how we can like mutually work to push these projects forward. Um, and uh, just a little breakdown of what we're going to do is we're going to kind of brief report back from the folks that I reached out to originally. Um, if we can keep our remarks at maybe about two minutes, um, like one or two, probably closer to one, because we're running out of time. Um, focusing on the broad theme, challenges, um, and next steps, like crucial to what, what we need to do. Um, and that way we, um, we will hear from our panel, our distinguished panel, who I will introduce them at that time. And then after that, we'll open it up to um, question and answer from the folks. So um, I guess just to uh, start off with uh, maybe hearing from, oh, and I actually have a microphone up on one of these chairs that uh, folks can come like report back so we can capture your remarks or um, videotape. Um, maybe somebody from the co-op track um, who could uh, share with us like some information about um, how that discussion went. Go ahead. Is 
another big one in co-ops, and uh, questions about authority, who's really in charge of the co-op. And one of the concrete solutions that we came up with was getting together and making sure we're organizing and creating a regional uh, umbrella for cooperatives. So cooperatives can collaborate, we educate and train each other, and uh, work out you know, the interpersonal skills that are actually specific to each cooperative's industry. So that was the concrete solution we came up with. Yeah, Pat, what was in the other cup? <laughs> oh, there are more than one session. So we uh, had a presentation from three, uh, three different perspectives. One is the whole Cleveland Evergreen model and how that evolved. The second was looking at uh, union, uh, union, uh, wor unions working in the food industry to leverage uh, the food, uh, the market share of the food, and the third was from the grassroots level in terms of incubating uh, cooperatives at a grassroots level. And I think with the first two, um, the insights that I took from that the, was really the sense of leverage. Um, one was, you know, one of the greatest challenges to building these things is to, to have capital and you know it takes millions and millions of dollars of capital to generate scale businesses and uh, and with the Cleveland model uh, it was really leveraging I believe the numbers were three million dollars in philanthropic donations into 30 million dollars in leverage capital in terms of tax credits and, and loans is that is that correct um, so really, how do you invest, how do you create these small investments and leverage them to scale up these kinds of businesses? And I think the second in the union, uh, one of the key features of that was uh, this whole, um, the whole power that folks like Walmart, these mega corporations have in claiming massive quantities of the market share of food and then really influencing all of the rest of the market. Uh, and how do you, using a cooperative model that's supported and grown out of a union, uh, a union basis where they have the industry uh, expertise, et cetera, et cetera, and leveraging, uh, creating the local farms that can then uh, unite to, uh, to nick away at that large piece of market share. And the more connected they are, the more powerful that leverage is. The model is small now, but it really has the capacity to claim up. Um, they were estimated 5% of the market share, is that correct? Um, so, so Walmart having 25%, so it's a real significant amount. And then having the cooperative buying power and you know, shared resources and shared political power can help to uh, make it that. Uh, and then the third was really this grassroots perspective of how do you incubate uh, locally owned businesses, and there's challenges in that, but it was really uh, the, the juiciest piece of insight I got from that was that it's more difficult for older folk to do this because we have this instilled mentality of, uh, of working, and it's hard to tip into that owning perspective. Um, but if you look at the younger folks, especially folks that are uh, under-resourced and economically oppressed, uh, as you look at the young people, there's an extraordinary amount of uh, entrepreneurship that is already in their lifestyle. Some of it's legitimate, some of it's not legitimate. But then they, that prepares them more for this enterprise kind of perspective, and therefore um, that next generation has a lot of capacity to to move in this kind of mentality without having to do the paradigm shift. Okay, now uh, we'll hear from folks in the, the finance track. You want to finance? Amazing. Matt. Hey, 
my name is Scott Morris. I'll, uh, I'll just report on part of it because we have one of our presenters, presenters right here. Uh, so this morning, first track in the, uh, the finance, uh, we heard about the creation of money. How it effectively it's just uh, notations on a ledger in a bank that is just created and destroyed that really uh, exist as most of us think it does. Um, and we had a, a great uh, rundown of a number of different kinds of currency systems that are being used all around the world by uh, Jackie Dunn, uh, many of which are spoken to in her book, Rethinking Money. Um, specifically, the power of social currencies, these new, new kinds of people power currencies uh, that have fantastic capacity to deliver uh, social and environmental benefits to uh, populations and to their environments uh, with very small budgets. So, uh, you know, there's a program in Belgium, I believe, the, the door is there where they have a uh, currency that is delivering um, 20 times the social benefit uh, that uh, a comparable euro budget could deliver. Uh, but simply because they're taking this euro budget and translating it to a social currency that is captured inside a region where the money can't leak out, you're seeing all these kinds of benefits that are being generated. I'll pass, uh, pass it over to Jack for the next part. Hello, uh, my name is Matt Weaver with Strike Debt. I uh, just wanted to report back. Um, we had a very good session in Boston, and both you and Q came out from New York. Uh, it started off, debt rules everything around me. Um, uh, uh, there's different projects, debt assemblies, we're trying to get people organized in different communities to speak out about the debt, um, relieve the shame, the anxiety that comes with it. We're all harboring it. Don't be ashamed of it. It's something we're all under the same pressure. Um, there's another project, Rolling Jubilee, raised over $700,000, abolished $15 million in medical debt in New York. If you know anyone or have ever been contacted by a debt collector, you know what type of suffering is going to lead to those people's lives. Um, uh, Superstorm Sandy, just wanted to know that FEMA actually gave loans uh, and the government acted as a lender. Uh, and in our, I do you want to call it, organized refusal of debt, all debt at this point, um, the debt is actually our leverage. That's what for. All right, I'm uh, Jeff Dickens with the Baltimore Bureau the local currency. Uh, in the second session today, uh, we're focused on uh, public banking solutions, including the progress that's been made in developing a postal bank that will be operating in all U.S. postal services. Um, service centers across the nation, and there's going to be a campaign starting in January around that. Um, also, the formation of a public bank, either at the state level or at the city level, which is a critical part of taking back our economy for ourselves and having a bank that works for us instead of on profit basis. Um, and then for, especially uh, in Baltimore, connecting uh, underserved communities with the resources that they need, the capital that they need, to create a strong and vibrant business community there, um, including the integration of the Vino local currency into the existing programs. And I would urge everybody here in this room to figure out how you can use local currency and the Vino in what you're doing um, and create programs around it so that we can spread it and take back the power of the economy of Baltimore for the people. Um, the final thing was suggestion that everybody could find an online resource for communication of all of the information that was disseminated today, and I believe that would be through itsourcommy.us and the other very good sites. Mm -hmm. And I'll be out front with the notes doing the exchange and have plenty of note information that you can take back into the brochures and the latest directories. Can I add a quick one onto that? Because one of the things we talked about was the importance of getting into the low-income communities in Baltimore to just start having more conversation about what is a debt-based economy like, what can you do with complementary currencies. So that was a big one, too, as a next step. Uh, one speaker in the second panel, sorry, two more seconds. Um, participatory with a bunch of things. <laughs> Josh Lerner, Aaron Tanaka, tell us about barriers to employment, for instance, um, participatory budgeting. Bang on the box, you're familiar with California, it should be everywhere. Uh, where are your resources going? Uh, it, they also said that it helps people think about community and makes government more responsible to the people. There's a million dollar youth participation project, 1225 years old youths, 
in Boston, they get to decide where the money's going for their community project. Uh, there's also a steering committee where it decides where the voting stations will be, so it's very
are community-based and community-driven. So we talked about a couple of structures, and we had um, uh, several guest speakers in our first session. Uh, Kelly Little from the Druid Heights CDC, who talked about CDCs, community, community development corporations, um, and how kind of kind of I think the was that the, the big resonating note from from his piece was you need community engagement to, to make it a really democratic process. Um, we talked about community land trusts, you know, this uh, form of the nonprofit the nonprofit that um, kind of treats land as a public good uh, that is controlled and, and democratically managed by the community. Um, and then we, and that was Michael Brown from Burlington Associates um, came and, and, and talked to us about community land trust. And then we also kind of talked about how these, and we also talked about land banks, which is different than a land trust, but it's a, it's a tool that can be used to, store, to sort of uh, acquire and dispose of vacant land and uh, kind of streamline that process and make it a more community driven process. So then we talked about examples in Philadelphia, and we had Marcus Presley from the Women's Revitalization, no, Women's Community Revitalization Project, WCRP, come and talk to us about how Philadelphia is doing something really innovative that combines, you know, they are a community land trust, and they worked with the coalition to actually get land bank legislation. Um, within this land bank legislation, they have a couple of values and language that promote certain values of participation, um, transparency and fairness. And so they, they really worked on putting forward a, a land bank bill that everyone could be um, ha happy about. And so using a land bank to then steward properties into a land trust. Um, and then we talked about kind of the work that's going on in Baltimore around um, building community land trusts, uh, sort of a coalition of, or a, a network of community land trusts in our city. So then kind of in the second session, we really drilled down deeper into what are, what what is a CLC and how does it work? And um, Michael gives a really great presentation um, that we will then be passing around think, through with this afterwards to everybody so you can sort of get some of that nitty gritty information. And what came out of that sort of next steps that we like to see is there's sort of a couple of needs, some research needs, um, educational needs, and organizing needs moving forward with uh, a CLC movement in Baltimore. Uh, one. The, uh, we w really want to look at inclusionary housing policy and how a community land trust um, could be used, how good community land trust could be a part of inclusionary housing policy. Another thing we looked at um, were kind of educational needs. How can you talk about this very complicated thing with, to the wider community, to everybody? So we talked about uh, different sort of popular education techniques we could use. Um, we also talked about a need for a centralized place to sort of have all of this information. Um, and then we talked about, oh, and the use of public art to sort of relay <coughs> uh, information about community land trust and what, what they are. Um, yeah, and so I think, I think that sums it up. There's lots of exciting movement going on and some real interest in um, seeing CLPs really uh, come to fruition and grow in, in Baltimore. Great. Thank you. We're a little behind on this segment, so if I could get one person from the food policy track who would be willing to share very quickly about um, some challenges or next steps um, that you see uh, in terms of uh, building food security. There's somebody still like to would like to Joyce, you yeah. oh. Awesome, thank you.
We talked about the community need to be involved in a lot of the decision making process. Not just come to the community with something that the city wants to offer, but collaborate and establish more of a partnership and addressing the food needs in the main place. Thank you. Um, 
energy control company Johnson's contr Johnson Controls uh, is was offering Boulder and is interested in offering many other cities um, basically no upfront cost transition to LEDs for literally all of the lighting, residential, commercial, street, everything. Uh, no upfront cost, 28% um, savings in, in, in roughly. Uh, so that's amazing. Um, so that's something Baltimore should look into. Uh, and then just to wrap up, also, we should all be following this uh, lawsuit that's been, that the Supreme Court recently agreed to hear. Um, from a group of, of young people, uh, the I Matter kids, um, are suing uh, over the with the idea on the basis that uh, you know the, the sky and our atmosphere is, is our common um, treasure, right? It's, it's our commons, and, and we should have a right that should be an asset for us, basically. Um, and then the last thing is a really cool idea that they did in Boulder, I think, uh, of a shadow uh, city council. And she had this idea of, of us doing this at the Real News Network. Um, and the goal, uh, they would meet once a month, and the goal all the time would be uh, how, how to achieve a future worth inheritance. So, some good ideas. Great. Um, so at this point, uh, we'll hear from reflections from our panelists, who I'm going to introduce right now. Um, I'm not going to be able to hear through their whole bios. <laughs> so um, in the order that we're going to hear from, we've got uh, Steve Dove, who's Research Director of the Democracy Collaborative at the University of Maryland, where he has led the development of the communitywealth.org web-based information portal. And um, Steve has also worked on the development of community wealth building strategies in a number of cities. And um, then we're going to hear from Michael Peck, who has, since 2000, um, served as the North American delegate for Mondragon, the world's largest industrial worker cooperative. Um, and in January 2014, Michael helped to launch the nonprofit One to One, which is www.oneworkeronevote.org, dedicated to solving America's unhealthy, unequal opportunity, mobility, and wealth divides through a broad-based equal share of worker ownership. And then um, lastly, we're going to hear from Dorcas Gilmore, who is a practitioner in residence in the Community and Economic Development Law Clinic at American University Washington College of Law. Previously, she's worked as Assistant General Counsel for the NAACP, representing the NAACP National Office, and it's over 1,000 local and state affiliates nationwide. And um, just to let you know beforehand, uh, I can point out Catherine, she'll give you the one minute sign when we have to move to the next speaker. <laughs> so, uh, I'll please start with you, Steve. All right, well, thank you uh, for the invitation to be at this conference, and uh, thanks for everyone who's participated. It sounds like a lot of uh, great ideas have come out of this conference, and uh, I'll just try to make a, a, a few remarks, and uh, you know, hopefully there'll be time after all of us for, for questions and further discussion. So, um, you know, and I think, and uh, I've been working at the Democracy Collaborative uh, with uh, Gar Alperovitz for the past 10 years, and I think you at least heard from Gar Alperovitz on screen yesterday, as I understand. Um, but I think it's important to place this work in, in the context of globalization, of, of deindustrialization, of deunionization. And I, I should say deindustrialization in the United States. There's plenty of industry, uh, but it's moved to other places, uh, China, Mexico, uh, et cetera. Um, but Baltimore, of course, was a major industrial center. And, and we're, we're dealing with that situation right now. Um, and it's worth noting what the, the standard economic development strategy has been. Um, and I heard somebody mention a casino, and that's certainly part of it. Mm. Um, and also, um, you know, we didn't talk about sports stadiums, but that's also part of it. Um, so there's actually $80 billion nationally that's uh, spent in terms of uh, state and local tax abatements and concessions to uh, private corporations in the United States. That's 80 billion a year, and that's a figure that was reported about a year ago in the New York Times on the front page. So it's fairly well corroborated. Uh, that's a low estimate. It's probably it's hard to keep track of all of these. And you know, Walmart alone, uh, there's a good group in DC called Good Jobs First, and they document that Walmart alone, you know, as part of their business model, gets in excess of a billion dollars a year in taxpayer subsidies. Um, and so, T 
TIF districts, uh, you know, property tax abatements, that kind of stuff, is actually important to understand because when we talk about creating the capital for an alternative economy, uh, the capital for an alternative economy actually exists. Um, and it's public subsidy going into supporting Fortune 500 companies. That's our current economic model. Um, and it's important to note that and, and try to organize uh, around that. Um, and, you know, and we're also faced with a situation because of globalization where the profits of the large corporations are more and more independent of the salaries of the rank and file workers and, and, and of the economic condition of the United States itself, right? And that affects, you know, uh, power distribution. It's part of the reason why we have so-called uh, gridlock in Washington, right? Um, so we have, uh, I think Garopovitz would put this as stagnation and decay. You know, you sort of get victories, but you don't really get things done. Um, and so a lot depends on the local level. Um, so, so what can you do? What, what, can, can, what can be done in Baltimore? Well, I think a lot of the good, you have a lot of good ex initiatives here, participatory budgeting, community land trusts, getting the, the co-ops better organized, the energy work. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, possibilities, but I think, you know, in terms of thinking about our time and, and what, 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 what we can do, um, and, and to quote from, uh, uh, I was just at a conference with Michael, actually, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, so uh, different loca locality for sure, but facing some of the same problems. And uh, a speaker there from the Highlander Center, uh, Laundrie Williams, mentioned, you know, we're in, we're in institution or organization building time. You know, it's not the time, we're not at the stage right now where we can, you know, uh, run against the barricades, you know, sort of a, it's not a 1789 moment. Um, but this is a really interesting time. In, in some ways, it's the worst of times. You know, we, we've seen wealth inequality that we never, that's historically unprecedented, actually. Historically unprecedented. Uh, you know, 400 people have uh, over $2 trillion in wealth right now. That's more than 60% of the US population. Um, so you could probably squeeze 400 people in this room and have as much wealth, you know, if you had the right 400 people from the Forbes 400 list uh, as, as three quarters of America. Um, and three fifths of America, sorry. Um, and, and, and yet we also have this proliferation of alternative models. The participatory budgeting didn't even exist in the United States at least a decade ago, and now it's spreading across cities. Uh, you have Boulder taking over the municipal utilities. You have uh, thousands of employee owned companies. You have a growing uh, worker co op movement that's still small but is certainly gaining momentum. And, and so I think we're in an interesting moment if we can think about starting to build, you know, what used to be called countervailing power, power that can, you know, that can counter at least the local level at first in Baltimore, and maybe later, you know, in Maryland, and maybe later at the, at the federal level, um, that can, you know, provide an alternative vision, can move those $80 billion and, and other subsidies, you know, the, the uh, tax expenditure budget in the United States is actually greater than the discretionary budget of the United States federal government. So more money is given out in tax breaks than in actual expenditures. That's the same situation of our federal government right now. Um, so, uh, so I would encourage us to think in terms of what are, you know, the Federation of Worker Co-ops sounds like a great idea. You know, getting, you know, building those kind of structures in place uh, that can actually sustain a movement uh, for the long haul because it won't be overnight, but I think we're at a point uh, where there's you know, tremendous interest, tremendous energy, and, and a lot to build on. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for spending your Saturday doing this. This is where it's at. So I just want to ask a show of hands, who wants to um, own your labor and rent your capital? <laughs> <laughs> and who wants to, the reverse, which is rent your labor and uh, someone else you know, owns the capital? <laughs> All right, well, good. So we have... <laughs> we Consensus have, reach. We have, <laughs> so I come from a 60-year model where we do this. It's called Mondragon. And uh, hands up again, who hasn't heard of it? 
Okay. Yes. So, 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 yeah, um, and that's fine because we are a work in progress. We have we have a saying that this is not paradise and, and we're not angels. Um, it's the most important saying that we have. We have a lot of sayings after 60 years. Um, we, we've made a lot of mistakes in our model. I just want to be uh, very humble about that. And um, uh, but our model has been studied by more graduate schools and uh, business schools, case studies, people opining on on who we are, what are we, what are we doing. So I just want to briefly talk about that, and I want to talk about what we're doing here in the United States under our new organization, our nonprofit, which is OneWorkerOneVote.org. Uh, basically, uh, we were started by a, a, a village priest, not a, a fancy priest, not a cardinal, or uh, we, and, and we were actually started by the substitute priest because the village priest that was assigned showed up and said, you've got to be kidding me, and left. And the substitute priest kind of took it on. And you know, you know, Spain in those days was a pretty bad situation between Franco's Civil War uh, and, the, and, 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 and the Second World War, and uh, Basques uh, were on the worst side of that. And you know, uh, some of our speakers have talked about the divide in Baltimore, the east-west divide in Baltimore. Well, let me tell you, if you're Basque, um, over the past 2,000 years, you've been told that your blood type is different, your head shape is different, you speak a language that nobody can understand, they don't even know where it came from. So I mean, you know, when you want to stack up differences against a minority population, there's about 2.2 million Basques, it's pretty easy to do. But one thing the Basques were good at, that, and they still are, is making things. Um, and so this priest came to the area in the middle of the Basque region, which is a mountainous region, uh, and uh, there was 55% you know, unemployment, there was famine, uh, there was cholera, uh, there was just about everything you'd find in a rubble-based economy. Um, and, and he started talking about collaboration. You know, if you don't collaborate, you know, you're not going to ever you know, connect the dots. And the way he started collaboration was by organizing football games. Because, you know, I, I'm sure we'll talk about this when we go to uh, uh, the Pratt Ale House after this event, we we'll really get down to what we do. <laughs> but, you know, sports, everybody speaks the same language. Good language to start off with. But he started a little school, and out of that school he graduated five engineers, and they formed a little cooperative that made kerosene stoves. And he went down to Franco's government in Madrid, and he asked for social security benefits, and the government said no, because they didn't know what a cooperative was. So he started his own insurance mutual, which today is you know, one of Europe's top 26, and, and pretty, pretty profitable. And the same when he went to get a loan, he wouldn't give it to him, so he started Caja Labrao, which is now called Labrao Cucha, which is the basis on which National Cooperative Bank in DC is formed on the street, um, just today a $50 billion bank and escaped pretty unscathed from the horrible financial tsunami of 2008, and which, by the way, is teamed up with National Corporate Bank, we had a big announcement last September. <coughs> and then that little school became Underground University, which has 3,000 students, it's a totally cooperative university, run and owned by the, the students, the, the parents, the teachers, and the cooperatives that hire them. And today we're a $24 billion group, we have 80,000 worker owners, we're in 39 countries, the seventh largest uh, um, multinational from Spain. Um, and, um, you know, uh, we believe basically that uh, employment is more important than profits, that if you focus on creating jobs, you will be profitable. We also believe in one worker, one vote. We also believe that there shouldn't be more than, you know, six to nine differences in salary between the lowest paid and the highest paid, because we think the solidarity economy proves its own metric. Um, and there's a lot of other things that we believe. Uh, we're in very competitive businesses, and, and we're in the US. And if you haven't seen a movie called Ship Change, you should. It's a great documentary. Uh, you can order it online. Ship Change, 70 minutes long. Um, show it here in the shop. Yeah, okay, that's good for you. That's good for you. Uh, show it again, because. <laughs> 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 because this school owns it, so if there's injuries, we can show it as many times good. as possible. And if you want me to come up from DC and talk about it afterwards, I'm happy to do that. And and so shift change t shows you that not only what Mondragon is doing <coughs> in places like Cleveland, which you know do part of their inspiration from Mondragon, but we're also um, there's also businesses that are taking um, on our principles, our values. One of our most important values is that we believe that labor is sovereign, and that capital, while important and necessary, is always subordinate to labor. That's why I said, you know, own your labor, rent your capital. Um, and, and, and so what we've done in the United States is in 2009, we teamed up 
with the United Steelworkers Union. Uh, it's one of America's most progressive unions. They've been behind uh, the Apollo Alliance, the Blue Green Alliance. You know, they, they are fighters for economic justice, environmental justice, and they have you know about a million members. And they, they make a lot of things, and they share the same values as us. And we never did this before. We didn't do this in Spain, and they've never done this before with a cooperative group. We teamed up uh, to try and do something different. It's called the Union Co-op Model with Mondragon Principles. We're now in 15 different cities in various degrees. We're launching projects left and right. You can find out what they are at oneworkeronevote.org. Um, everything from jewelry, uh, a union co-op from women that were uh, battered and, and, and hassled. Uh, in Cincinnati uh, to uh, our harvest, which we talked about. I don't know if Dennis is here. Uh, Dennis, are you here? Yeah, Dennis is here. Dennis Olson uh, from the United Food and Commercial Workers Union uh, talks about that. Um, to um, uh, commercial laundry, uh, where we borrowed uh, heavily and are still borrowing from the Evergreen model, uh, because you know we want to be eclectic. We want to cross pollinate. You know, again, um, you know, this is not paradise. We're not angels. Nobody knows everything. We need to borrow from each other, share, get best practices and improve our act. I'm totally hoping to do the, bo the Boulder model because, you know, the energy situation in this country is one of the last great plantations that we've got to get off of. Um, and energy independence means everybody has the right to their own energy control, a voice and a vote on their energy. Um, so uh, basically, this is a movement that, it, it, that is focused on business principles, but with a morality and a democracy and a happy ending for workers. And there's no substitute for sweat equity. I just want to tell you that. Um, sweat equity is like the number one characteristic you have to bring to this game. Uh, because if you're not willing to put in sweat equity, it is not, you know, add water and stir. But, but for those people who tell you, I have to talk to uh, people in Wall Street all the time um, who will never think like I do, but it doesn't really matter because what we're proving is that our way is more profitable than their way. And we're calling this in our movement virtuous psychometrics, and that is, that is taking the phrase doing well by doing good and actually showing why it's a more profitable mechanism. So if anybody wants to meet me at the Yale House afterwards, I will go into great detail on this. But again, thank you for having me. Thank you for having this event. It's very exciting. Um, I'm, I'm really pumped about all of you. Conveniently enough, the mat to the bar is right next to Michael. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're going to be cruising down to the Pratt Street Ale House after this to keep the conversation going. Um, of course, from here on out, I should just let you know that uh, the tab is on me. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then for our last speaker, we need to Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, so, I just want to highlight a, a few things that were themes that I saw in um, the beginning and all the way through the end, and definitely in the two presentations um, that we just had and comments um, that were striking to me. And that is that we are beginning from the place that from the ashes, whether the ashes are in Madragon or whether the ashes are in Baltimore, or whether the ashes are in whatever place we find them, that that is where innovation begins. And so that our value principle really is that those who have lost the most have the ability to create the most in terms of getting us to a different and that beginning from that proposition, that we are able to then create new systems. <coughs> because if we believe that the system is going to be, any new system is going to be created by the same kind of people, right? I mean, really. Right? So if, if it is that low-income community, low-income black community is involved in have been in decay, <coughs> this concept of decay, for 60 years, and have been figuring out ways, and black communities have been figuring out ways, cooperatively, to manage and thrive in decay, then why not begin there? And so, one of, I hope, 
the values that we will move forward with in Baltimore is that we begin in the communities that are most impacted. And we begin with the community members who have been most impacted. And that they will lead the way. That's one piece that seems to have worked. It seems to have worked in Brazil. It seems to have worked in Montreal, right? So if it worked there, that we not try to do something different here. Mm -hmm. That we actually allow the folks who are most impacted to leave here. One first point. The, the second piece that was really um, striking was when we talk about people-centered approaches. Which people? How do we think about people-centered approaches as the entire community? And one of the things that was uplifted last night was that in thinking about community, three things that were necessary to sustaining that community, uh, elevated by the town, thought very well, were hope, trust, No, keep going, Dorcas, because this is important. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And that one of the ways forward 
is for us to make a commitment to values, articulating what our values are, clarifying what our vision is, and then thinking about the variety of ways in which we in our individual lives and collectively can help to put into action, whether through financing or through organizing to push public systems that already have existing resources to do whatever it is we need them to do. So we have multiple opportunities here. So I hope that with a community-centered, community-led process in which we're committing to stay together and make sure that, frankly, we don't do what we've talked about other folks doing, meaning, I'll, I'll say, me first. That a person with uh, education sits as the expert when there are people who have experiences and are having those experiences on a day-to-day -day basis could sit here, right? So I think part, part of that process of a people's assembly also is how are we accountable for what we're talking about? How do we make sure that, that we're doing what it is we're trying to put in action and that we show it in how we go about doing it, okay? So the next time that I say no, not Dorcas, that I recommend someone who can sit here and talk about community economic development, not because they teach community economic development, right, or work in community, but because they're a person who is low income and who is dealing with the issues that are being discussed. So, I'll just use that as a, as a model for I hope where we're going how we want to get there, and a specific example of some of the things that actually we need to shift and think about. Um, so I'll leave you with that. I can talk for a long time. So we only have a little time, but uh, I think that's like too good a note to like not jump off into um, just kind of an open discussion here. Um, like, so I, I just want to jump off of that. Like, what, what do folks think about an idea like this, like a Baltimore's People Assembly? And, um... Hello. Yeah, hi. My name is Mia Redman. I'm a new leader. I've lost the most, so I guess I'll create the most. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from representing residents in the EDI.
I often go to the museums all over the city. They're always located in some sort of a rec center or a church. And hundreds of people come out. And they have a little microphone where, where the citizens go up to that microphone, and that is the only outlet of a voice that they have. And this organization has been, has been working for years. Uh, they do a great job. So I would suggest to you that if you have an idea of allowing the people who are actually organized and they know what they need and want, you already have some resources that are pretty active here in the city, and I encourage you to connect with them. I don't live in Baltimore, but I came because where I live, wonderful things like this don't go on. But I would also encourage you to look at Baltimore as the center of a regional economic system. It's, it's not in this fight alone, and it doesn't need to stand alone by itself. But there's the same thing that you've got Terrell County, you've got Hartford County, you've got different counties surrounding you that are dealing with the same issues. And it could really be a powerful center of what's going on regionally and not just to look at this, uh, this energy as a local thing, because I think it was absolutely wonderful and I'm glad I could be a part of it. Um. Yeah, um, I look at this as an opportunity uh, for us not to look at our own neighborhoods, but also look at other neighborhoods and see how we can come together in all these neighborhoods so that we can make Baltimore a better place to live. Uh, Baltimore will be more responsive to its citizens. Uh, I, I believe that if we just stay in our little groups, then we're not going to accomplish much. But if we go out there and we, we, we protest and we, we advocate with other people and other organizations, because what we all are talking about is living life to the fullest. So that everyone would have a place to go, everyone would have a job that pays them a living wage, uh, where, where, where people are not living in slums and, and uh, with boarded houses all around them. See, uh, and we need to take this not just to our neighborhood, but to the whole whole city. And and and, and what we should do, what I think I would like to see done, is that. Whoever has something going on in their part of the city should be putting it out there so you can get more people to come in and help you with those things that you need to be need to be done. Like you talked about those 700 people that was displaced and and, 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 and in about 15 years it's going to be a hundred more hundred thousand or more going to be displaced. Uh, but you know where where can we be? you at so that we can hear what it is that you need and you can tell us how we can help you. Great, thank you. I, that, that's basically like the kind of discussion that we want to have, like kind of like with what um, was talked about with the Jackson People Assembly, like <coughs> we need to kind of like reach beyond the like traditional um, uh, divisions of race, place, income, specialization. And um, what was it? Uh, Dean John Morris was here this morning. He was on um, Mark Steiner yesterday. He said, you know, we need to have like infrastructure to kind of like build this going forward rather than um, this being just like event based. So, um, just, just to clarify something about the Jackson People Assembly is that it's a part of the Malcolm X grassroots movement, right? So the, there's a larger organization of people, say people in this room. And there, there is an agenda of values, vision, that, that they have come to. And the, the People's Assembly is then a vehicle for thinking about, I can't remember if they said they had other people, 12 committees, something of that nature, right? So then the People's Assembly is a mechanism that is a part of a larger structure around um, creating an agenda and policy advocacy and growing political candidates. So it's all together, right? So that, that's really what I'm talking about. How do you have kind of a full system in which you have people's assemblies that are tied to particular issues where there's education and advocacy and it then feeds back into pushing existing political candidates but also 
also grow in new ones. And we've only got like, time for just a couple more. Um, I can have a uh, and then... Yo! <laughs> <laughs> a few volunteers that will work with Chris to organize the next meeting. Who else would like to be helpful with that? Bonnie and Stephanie and tell me your name. <laughs> I'm volunteering. Huh? And Paolo and who else? I don't know your name. Nina and oh okay great and James. And Meredith. Okay, so I guess if you if you yeah, want to let's let's definitely circle back as soon as this is over. So as, at the end of this, yeah, go to Chris and, and make a list and yeah. um and let's keep this going. That's really exciting. And um I don't want to take over. You finish. No, that, that's um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, definitely um, look to uh, www.itsourconomy.us for um, the information portal so we can share some of the information that we shared today. Um, definitely want to provide that service. Um, and I'll connect with folks. Uh, we have maps to the bar nearby. And uh, I just really want to thank everybody for sticking with it today. I know it's been a long, hot day, and it's a Saturday. And I want to thank all of our speakers all day who have donated their time to speak with us.